Good evening, I'm Chuck Davis. Tonight on News Team 2, U.S. airlines decide to put a cap on commissions they pay to travel agencies. Can the agencies survive? I'll have that story. I'm Barbara McDonald. The Department of Education is launching a national campaign to focus attention on attention deficit disorder. We'll visit a local school and tell you why you need to know about ADD. And I'm John Myers. The battle for the MIAA Conference League going on right behind me. We'll have that and more tonight on News Team 2. You're watching KQTV St. Joseph. U.S. airlines are putting a cap on the commissions they pay to travel agencies. Could this hurt the travel agency business? Some agencies are certainly worried that it might. Our Chuck Davis has been following the story, and he joins us now from the newsroom. Now, Chuck, how will this uh, limiting commissions hurt the travel agencies? Well, Scott, the first thing you need to know is that 100% of a travel agency's revenue is commission. Now, that's commission from tour companies as well as airlines. So travel agencies are worried they're going to have to start charging their customers for services they now offer free of charge. Charade. The prosecution has closed the week of testimony in the People v. O.J. Simpson case in a very dramatic way today. Scott joins us now at the Monitor with more. Scott? Thank you very much, Dave. Prosecutor Marsha Clark gave jurors their first look at the infamous bloody glove found at the murder scene. Angie Crouch has more tonight from outside the Los Angeles County Courthouse. Phillips spent a third day on the witness stand and appeared to change his testimony a bit from yesterday. Upon cross-examination, defense attorney Johnny Cochran got Phillips to admit that O.J. Simpson did ask one question when he was told of his ex-wife's death. When court resumes Tuesday morning, Detective Tom Lang will be back on the witness stand. He's expected to reveal for the first time what O.J. Simpson told police during an interrogation the day after the murders. In Los Angeles, Angie Crouch for ABC News. Now, jurors had seen a picture of that glove before, but this was the first time that the actual item was brought out in the courtroom. A matching glove was found at Simpson's estate, but that glove has not yet been entered into evidence. Pictures of it, though, have been shown. Deb? You're watching KQTV St. Joseph. From America's heartland, this is News Team 2. Good evening, everyone. I'm Scott Pickey. And I'm Deborah Ross. Thanks for joining us this evening. As expected, Chiefs quarterback Joe Montana called it a career this afternoon. Montana officially announced what had been anticipated for weeks. John Myers joins us now with more on that announcement. John? Scott, Montana surprised uh, virtually no one with his announcement this afternoon. He made it in the city where he made a Hall of Fame career, San Francisco. Montana was joined by 49ers officials, his former coach, Bill Walsh, and Chiefs President and GM Carl Peterson. Montana joked that he was going to play for the Bulls in the NBA. In the NBA. That drew laughs, but for real, Montana is hanging it up. And I, I have to be honest with you because I really and truly never thought that this day would ever come where I would, um, saying that word, retirement, but unfortunately it's here. All right, it is here. Montana's career is over after uh, 15 years with the, the uh, 49ers, two with the Chiefs. We'll have much more on today's events coming up in sports. Scott? All right. Thanks, John. Mike Brasiano's weather forecast bears the endorsement of the American Meteorological Society. Well, uh, if uh, the rainy weather does anything and the cloudy weather, it uh, brings us this. And for mushroom lovers, you know what this is called. You know what this is and look a little bit closer and this is how big they are and we can't tell you exactly where these are located because there'll be a rush on them these are the morels and they're tremendous they're just if you've never had a mushroom a morel mushroom then you're really missing out but uh, with all the cloudy skies and the rain uh, there are just a bunch of them to be found at this location and we're not going to tell you where it's at you just got to look for yourself but uh, and the clouds and the rain are going to stick around I think for tomorrow morning as well it looks like for the apple blossom parade right now pretty good bet that we're going to see some sunshine and here it is here it the morel is. mushroom this is the morel have you ever had one before? Yes, they're I never great. have. You soak them in salt water overnight, and then you dip them in some batter and fry them up. And mm. Sounds I'm not going to tell you where it's at, though. I haven't had any yet. It's in Scott's backyard. No, <laughs> it's not. You might get a few phone calls on that. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Uh -huh. Well, the 
Apple floats are lining up and people are getting ready to kick off this year's annual Apple Blossom Parade. Now Scott Mickey and Barbara McDonald are standing by ready to bring us all of the latest on the festivities. And there they are. Hi guys, Good how's morning. it going? We want to meet uh, <laughs> our special guest this morning is Red. Red, Mike, it's cold out here and Red is shaking. Paul, can you get a close up on this little dog? Red marched last year and he's going to be walking in the parade today. And Mike, he's cold. He's also a little nervous, that's why he's shaking, but... <laughs> He'll be all right, I think. He'll be all right. He's out here with the folks from Mead. We got people out here from just about everywhere, don't we? And uh, I guess the big news of the day is uh, Pat Dillon's Model A tractor uh, died a couple of hours ago. They'll be working on that, trying to get it back up. It leaked something also underneath, so we, we'll keep you updated on that story. A lot of people out already. Barbara and I got here about 8.30, and everyone was lined up. We have a crowd uh, over here, and as you can see, everyone's They're lined up. They're fans of Red, though. <laughs> he has a whole fan group coming out to watch him uh, march in the parade this morning. A lot going on. Of course, the parade starts this morning at 10 o'clock. So uh, by the time we come back here during the uh, 10 o'clock half hour, you're going to see all of these uh, floats and trucks and cars uh, come swinging by. And, of course, uh, just a little chilly, cloudy, no rain. And hopefully uh, Mike's forecast is right that we won't see rain until later on this afternoon. Mike, do you have any good news for Red? Is it going to warm up anytime soon? Tell Red that he needs to, to relax a little bit. I don't <laughs> think he's cold. He's just nervous about he's the fact uptight. that he he, to He's walk a in little the nervous about his television debut. You know, he's been in the parade before, so that's okay. It's just he's, he's never been on television before, but he's handling it quite well. He doesn't have much to say. He's the quiet type. <laughs> but, you know, I think everybody in St. Joe is out here today, and you guys need to come on out and join us because the weather is holding up. And uh, we're having a great time. We're going to come back in, what, about 20 minutes, yeah. a half an hour or so, Laurel? I also want to remind you that uh, tonight at 1030, you can watch the parade if you don't make it out. We're going to be taping it today. Joey Miller, Chuck Davis, joining you a little farther down Frederick tonight at 1030 for the entire parade coverage of, and then again tomorrow afternoon at 3 o'clock. So if you don't make it out uh, this morning to catch it live, join us tonight at 1030 and get the uh, entire scoop via television. We're going to warm Red up and uh, calm him down a little bit, and uh, we'll see you later on in the he show. He won't be back with us because he'll be marching. Okay. okay. Well, right. he's got his job to do, yeah. so <laughs> we'll be back to you guys in a minute. Okay. Oh, my. Oh, Red's a little nervous. Well, yes. Wouldn't you be? Well, yeah. You if you had to when walk, you're out there, If I be. was a dog and had to walk in the parade, I'd be a little nervous. See? <laughs> That's how life goes, I suppose. What mm -hmm. can you say? <laughs> well, we'll see. <sighs> well, you know what? Spring is in the air, and celebration is beginning as the Apple Blossom Parade gets ready to get underway. Well, Scott and Barbara are standing by, and they're ready to give us the latest this morning. You have another update. Good morning, guys. Good Mike. morning. Yes. It's chilly out here. But is it raining? But it's not raining. You're right. There so you it was go. only a slight chance of rain. <laughs> but, Mike, your little warning about the videotapes, I don't think that's going to happen today. No, no, it won't happen today. But I remember eight tracks, too. Hey, thanks. So. Our special guest this uh, half hour, Ron Rosenauer, he's uh, the festival. Ron, turn around. Well, we got shirts like this, but we didn't get one of these. He's festival staff, which makes him very I important. I just have the front. Very important. And, uh, Ron, tell us what's going on this morning. We're getting lined up, ready to go. Getting lined up. We have a tremendous crowd uh, all along the parade route that I've uh, driven and uh, a good uh, lineup all the way back with thousands of people. <laughs> so I know at 10 o'clock we'll get going. It's amazing to think that it's really going to happen, but it will. How long have you uh, been planning on this? Since the day after last year's, or uh, how yeah. long does it take? Basically, it takes about the year, you know, in entirety, but we go in earnest probably in December of the year, of the year before. How many entrants do you have this year? Do you have that? Uh, we have about 105, and that, that's about three or 4,000 people in that, though. No Tell you us know, some of the groups that are that are out here today. Oh, we got uh, a huge contingent from Darcy School of Dance, and and we've got, uh, my gosh, there are people from all over the, uh, the, the four-state area, really. We've got quite a few people from out of town, and uh, I can't even think of all the people. we got Jean Queen. She's going to be here with her fantastic uh, magic bus. And uh, just a tremendous Is number. she the one with the hippie bus that we can see from here? She <laughs> is, yes. We're, we're, we're very fortunate. We've got several major businesses this year. They're going to have floats and other entries, so it's looking great. All right. Ron Rosenauer, thanks for joining us. We know you're a busy man. We will let you go and right. start the parade. Thank just you. a few minutes. We're ready. Ron, yeah, about 15 minutes. They're going to get going, and uh, we're going to be here the entire time. And so 
Come back and join us. Yeah, stick around or come out, say hey, and uh, watch the parade from anywhere down Frederick. You can and, see the people uh, lining up on Frederick now, right in front of LeBlanc. Lining up. Now, a reminder that tonight at 10:30, we're going to bring you the parade in its entirety right after the news. So if you don't make it out this morning, watch it tonight. That'll do it for us. We'll send it back to the studio, and uh, we'll be back later in the half hour. Great, guys. We'll be back to you in just a couple minutes. And for all of you who are wondering, you want to go out and catch the parade this morning, we have a map that you can take a look at so you can see the actual parade route, the route that the parade is going to take. It's going to start. It's going to go down Frederick. As you can see, it's going to go down Frederick by City Hall. It's going to wrap around downtown, and then it is going to end up at 9th and Edmonds. so you can catch all the floats if you want to position yourself anywhere along the route. And Mike will be out. That's right. We've and got excited. 16 tons of candy, from what yes. I understand. So, or 16 pounds. I, you know what? I would guess <laughs> the pounds is probably more accurate. Okay. Yes. I, I get mixed up on those pounds, tons. You're busy enough right now without thinking about something else to make. But a day or two after Christmas, that's when a couple of ideas might be welcome for some of our holiday goodies. Well, first help. Think stir. And yes to clean air. And I'm John Myers. We're getting ready for some district action in Savannah tonight. Me, my friends and I will have that and more on News Team 2 next. You're watching KQTV St. Joseph. From America's heartland, this is News Team 2. Good evening, everyone. We begin tonight with a late afternoon fire that has sent two firefighters to the emergency room. Our Barbara McDonald was on the scene this afternoon, and she joins us here on the set with Boar. Barbara, what's the latest on the well, fire? Well, fire crews were called out to check on smoke coming from an attic, but within minutes, the situation was much more serious. When crews arrived, smoke was emitting from the third floor of this house at 11th and Angelique. Thinking the coast was clear to remove personal belongings, residents and neighbors went in. Um, when I went over to the door, everybody was going inside to bring things out, and on the opposite side of the house, there was someone yelling for help, and I was screaming from the outside that someone was yelling for help. I ran inside, but I knew there was too much smoke. I wasn't going to go in, but the fireman was coming head down and, and fell at my feet. And Tom Rinderneck owns the building and lives on the first floor with his wife. There, that's my life sitting there. How am I supposed to feel? It's gone. Witnesses say the fire started in the third floor when a lit incense stick fell into a waste paper basket. Okay, so far we still don't have um, any word on the status of the two firemen that were sent to Heartland East. They are there. We do know that. We do know that one um, probably is suffering from smoke inhalation and then the other one that we saw could possibly have more serious injuries. Names will not be released until next of kin has been notified, and um, crews are still on the scene, so we will have more as the story develops. Okay, more at 10. Thanks, yes. Margaret. Well, investigation into a Denton, Kansas robbery took to the air today as law enforcement officers searched the area by plane. Two men with handguns robbed the Bank of Denton yesterday afternoon, and the two suspects continue to elude authorities at this hour. Tracy Steele has been following the story, and he joins us now from the newsroom with more. And Tracy, an incident like this uh, is big news anywhere, but especially in Denton, Kansas. Well, Deb, that's right. The small size of Denton, Kansas may be the reason the robbers decided to victimize that town's bank, but it also brings a sense of uneasiness to a town that's used to calm. 150 people live in Denton, Kansas. The Bank of Denton is equipped with a burglar alarm, but most people never expected it to be necessary. Now that Tina Frakes and her co-workers have been held up at gunpoint, they know things may never be the same. On the way home, I was looking at vehicles and people, you know, and, oh yeah, by far I'll be more attentive to who's coming in and have we seen them before and license plates and everything. 
Two white males armed with handguns held the bank up at 305 Thursday afternoon. One suspect is described as 5 foot 10 inches tall, 160 to 180 pounds. The other is 6 foot 1 inches tall, 220 pounds. Two vehicles are connected with the incident, a burgundy Chevy van with Kansas plates and a blue sports car with the Missouri license plate number EGC107. Authorities believe the vehicles may still be in the area and are searching for them both on land and in the air. The old hand water pump in the middle of Denton's Main Street is a symbol of the town's history. The Bank of Denton has a history as well, over 100 years in length and one robbery. That occurred Thursday. As you might imagine, the robbery is the chief topic of discussion at places like the watering hole Bar and Grill. All day long. <laughs> That's why I came into town for lunch. <laughs> Joking aside, the incident weighs on local residents' minds. Like I was gone yesterday, my door was unlocked, and I come back and felt really uneasy. I looked for cars around, and, and uh, uh, no, one was, no one was around. Nothing was odd, but it made me stop more. Now, if you have any information, you can call the Donovan County Sheriff's Department at 913-985-3711. Now, bank robbery is a federal crime, so the FBI is taking part in the investigation. Okay, Tracy, thank you very much. Tracy Steele reporting tonight from the newsroom. Also tonight, two men were killed in a head-on collision south of Gower in northwest Missouri. The Highway Patrol says a car driven by 42-year-old Stephen Insko of St. Joseph crossed the center line of US-169 and collided with a car driven by 69-year-old Carl Moody of Plattsburgh. The two drivers were killed, and a passenger in Moody's car was hospitalized. The Missouri Department of Natural Resources has found pesticides in almost half of the state's public surface water supplies. Regulators say 10 of the supplies violate federal drinking water laws. The department released a study this week that says 49 of the state's 102 public surface water supplies contain pesticides. Those pesticides include atrazine, the most commonly used weed killer in the country. Bob Waters will have more on this story for you tonight at 10. Scott? Also, smokers beware. Lighting up is no longer as easy as it once was. And as News Team 2's Dennis Evans reports tonight, smoking in public places may soon be a thing of the past. Carolyn Jones Meyer has been smoking for more than 27 years, but she says for the sake of her children, she wouldn't mind seeing a smoke free society. Just lucky, those of us that do smoke, that there are still a few places we can go to. And, and uh, we all have non-smoker friends now, so there's a lot of times we don't sit in the smoking section anyway. So I, it's got to be weeded out somehow. The way things are going and into public smoking may be sooner than we think. Dunkin' Donuts is the latest franchise to clear the air. The company has banned smoking at any of the chain's 3,000 U.S. shops. With more and more public places becoming smoke-free, many smokers are beginning to wonder if the only safe place to light up will be at home. Yeah, one of these days it, it seems like it's getting to where all you're going to be able to do is you might be able to smoke in your own home if you're lucky. <laughs> I mean, that's what it's starting to feel like. And how do non-smokers feel about the new ban on lighting up? I don't think our building should be smoke-free. It depends on what the institution is. I think like this institution, I think it should be outside. But as far as restaurants, I think it's okay to have the smoking and the smoking. That doesn't bother me too much. But ready or not, it looks like America is on the way to clearing the air. Dennis Evans, News Team 2. And Dennis adds that while smokers may be forced to go outside, that apparently is not a deterrent to American teens. The American Cancer Society reports that each day in America, 3,000 teens light up for the very first time. And whether you go smoke free or not, more and more kids are lighting up. Not and good that news. is a shame. Well, still to come on News Team 2. Public Radio's reaction to Republicans cutting and gutting the national budget. That and more when we come back. You're watching News Team 2 with Deborah Rumps, Scott Pickey, Meteorologist Mike Brasiano and Sports Director John Myers. 
Cadillac, it's the standard by which all others are judged. And the 95 Sedan DeVille Smart Lease is your reason to experience automotive excellence. Over 60% of today's Cadillacs have been leased. And now you can lease your Sedan DeVille for $5.45 a month. You'll get the excellence of a Cadillac with its fully independent speed-sensing suspension, anti-lock brakes, dual airbags, and North Star system. Cadillac, creating a higher standard. See Greg Motors in St. Joseph, Boyles in Maryville, Phelan in Atchison, Red X in Cameron, and Barnes Baker in Chillicothe. Tonight on TGIF, Urkel becomes Elvis. Say, where's Lisa Marie? You don't want to know. And all new family matters. Then the guys have to write a biography. Anybody? Anybody. I pick Shaw. I pick Cork. How about Nancy Kerrigan? In your dreams. And all new Boy Meets World. And get to know the real Cody. I'm like a real good listener. Sometimes I hear people even when there's nobody talking. Step by step. Plus, Mickey won't wear her glasses, so the gang tries a little child psychology. And all new Coop. Watch the best shows tonight on KQ2. Public broadcasting officials say cuts approved by a House panel are less severe than they had feared. A House Appropriations Subcommittee approved big cuts for public broadcasting's budget for fiscal 96 and 97. News Team 2's Laura Davis talked with staff and volunteers at KXCV Public Radio in Maryville. Laura, what kind of impact would these proposed cuts have on the Maryville station? Well, Deborah, KXCV receives about $100,000 a year from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. That amounts to 25% of their annual budget. The station is fighting the proposed cuts by appealing to its supporters to write their congressman. The KXCV broadcasts continue as on-air questions loom in Washington. The station sent letters to listeners asking them to take an active role in fighting these cuts. The headline reads, Save 29 Cents, Lose Public Radio. We don't have the population base or the corporate base to pick up what CPB funding gives us, those federal dollars that come to us on an annual basis. Uh, it's peanuts in the greater picture of things. The whole arts package is peanuts. If the cuts occur, two jobs will disappear and certain programming will be affected. It's like Morning Edition and All Things Considered, Car Talk, uh, some of the uh, classical music concerts that we have every afternoon and evening. The reductions are part of a $6 billion package of cuts proposed by Republicans. But some public radio supporters think the cuts have nothing to do with money. The issue is the depth and balance that you have in public radio uh, news reporting. And I think there are people in Congress who do not like depth and balance in their reporting. But as far as I'm concerned, they're very helpful in our maintaining our democracy because we need informed citizens. So what if public radio and television would just disappear? We could survive without it. It's a question of, to me, of what is the function that it actually serves in our society. And I think that, uh, to a very large extent, there are a lot of people who don't get cable television, and this is their only source for any kind of cultural or uh, intellectual sort of programming. And without public broadcasting, they simply wouldn't have that. Now, backers of the cut say public broadcasters will learn to get along with less. And meanwhile, the CPB cuts were okayed at the subcommittee level. There are several more votes before these cuts are actually sealed in concrete. Okay, Laura, thank you very much for that report. It's been an ongoing battle and an argument between CPB and the government for a long time. And Looks like it we'll will continue our, to. Our fingers crossed for uh, whoever seems to be best. I know I'm a public radio listener, and I'd hate to see the uh, funding go down anymore. Well, weatherwise, the ice storm is by now all but a distant memory. That is except for the city's public works department. For months, the city has been cleaning up and clearing debris left from the December storm. Now it appears the work is almost through, almost three weeks ahead of schedule. Uh, it looks like uh, because of the real good weather we've had and, and we didn't have to pull our crews off because of snowstorms and what have you, uh, we're going to finish our brush collection. In fact, we have finished it uh, in, in all of the areas in town, the districts in town. And Burris also says that all that remains is simply a few cleanup areas. That seems like a distant memory with these oh, 70 I know. degree days. And if you, there's still a whole bunch of those uh, piles of mulch around the area. But to, I mean to tell you that was a huge mess uh, with that ice storm. And uh, I think that uh, we're going to start to see a little bit of a turn back to the colder air. And we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But first, the weather watchers and 40s right now. 45 degrees in Gallatin, 45 in Bethany. 
up in uh, Fairfax is 48. And Troy, Kansas checks in at 48 as well. Hey, what a great looking Saturday forecast we have to share with you, and we'll get to that after this. Enjoy low monthly payments with a two-year smart lease from your gold medal Chevy dealer. Like the 95 Chevy S Series, it's so new that everything else is history. And you pay only $209 per month for two years at your local gold medal Chevy dealer. Arm Brewster in Falls City, Barnes Baker in Chillicothe and Trenton, Boyles in... Shamrock has been in business since 1871. Our expansion is going to be in two parts. The first part is going to be to build some additional storage facilities. With the expansion, uh, our new addition to the assembly building will allow us to do larger and heavier pieces than we're able to do now. It should create somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 12 new jobs. That's approximately a 25% increase in our shop crew. Mercantile Bank, Heartland Health System, and KQ2 are St. Joe proud. Mike Brasiano's weather forecast bears the endorsement of the American Meteorological Society. Well, we did have a few clouds around uh, this morning, but the sunshine quickly returned this afternoon. The winds were still out of the north, though, and so the cool air stayed around. What's going to happen is tomorrow, winds are going to switch, and they're going to be out of the south and west at 15 to 25 miles per hour. That's going to allow us to really warm back up but I think we've got a big change happening and the jet stream right now is well up to the north and it is cutting through Canada and the coldest air once again is staying up to the north but I think that by the middle part of next week some of that cold air will come back down and revisit us revisit us that's the correct saying <laughs> and I think that's going to be happening as I mentioned by Tuesday or Wednesday but tomorrow look at this these are what we're talking about, temperature departures. We're talking about the normal temperature should be around 42 degrees here in St. Joseph. We're going to be some 20 to 25 degrees above that tomorrow, as well as look at some of these areas in western Nebraska that could see highs in the 80s, highs in the 80s in that area. So we're going to see uh, some warmer air uh, right here in the Midwest, and it looks like it's going to be short-lived, though, because I think that on Sunday things will start to cool back down. Another mild night for us tonight, though, as temperatures should stay in the uh, 30s to 40s, 20s, teens, and single digits staying well up to our north. What is happening is tomorrow we'll have a storm that's trying to make its way down towards us, and I actually think that this one's going to make it here by Sunday night, and that'll give us a slight chance for some precipitation as it moves in from the north. But before that, as we talked about, southerly winds coming out anywhere from 15 to 25 miles per hour are really going to allow us to warm up into the uh, 70s. Uh, there are going to be some snowflakes going on, still winter up in the northeast. They could see some heavy snows as well, and a few showers and a few thunderstorms even down into much of southwestern Texas. Here's the actual temperatures for tomorrow. We're talking about 70s for us. I think we'll be in the lower 70s, which could come close to a record. Uh, and uh, you can see 60s, 50s, and single digits well up to our north. But this will be short-lived. Speaking of temperatures, let's go ahead and show you what's going on right now. Currently outside, it's 51. Humidity is at 24%. The barometer is at 30.23 inches and falling. Uh, gusty wind out of the south at 21. Rivers at 9.2 feet. And sunrise tomorrow is going to be at 6.59. Today's high occurred uh, around 3 o'clock, and that was 52. This morning's low was 18. And nothing to report so far as uh, rain in the rain gauge. Back in 1930, the record high of 83 was set, two below the record low in 1914. And normally we should be at 44 for a high, and 22 is our normal low. Well, for tonight, we're going to have clear skies. And we'll drop down to about 37 degrees. And the reason behind that is that we're going to have south winds at 10 to 20 miles per hour. For tomorrow, oh, you can't beat this on a Saturday. Look at that. Mostly sunny and 74. Tomorrow night's low will be 46. South winds at 15 to 25. And then on to Sunday. There'll be a slight chance for rain on Sunday night. Otherwise, partly cloudy skies and a high of 62. Well, you can't ask for better than that yes, on the weekend. Yes, but as we talked about, it is going to be short-lived because me, the middle part of next week, we're talking about 30s. Mm. Makes me want to get out and mow the grass tomorrow or something. <laughs> do something just to get out and enjoy yeah, it. Yeah, you could do that. Wash a few vehicles. That would be pop possible as well. Just in time for them to get all dirty again by the just, middle of the week. Just that's right. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> okay, Mike. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Well, after a week of play, district titles are up for grabs. Several area teams with a shot at the state tournament. John Myers will have a preview next in sports.
an exciting night of basketball ahead for several area teams. Tonight is championship night across the region. John Myers is at the site of a couple of championships that will decide who goes to state. Hi, John. That's right, Scott and Deb. We've got an exciting one going right here right now. The Chillicothe and Carney girls going at it for the uh, 3A district girls title. Right now it's 18 to 11. Uh, Chillicothe has the lead. Later tonight, Maryville meets Chillicothe in the boys' final. The Spoof Hounds, of course, 28-0 after last night's semifinal win against Savannah. Hey, it was a uh, rough one last night, a fast-paced game. It was close until Maryville pulled away in the fourth quarter. The Hounds got 23 from Mike Morley, 16 from Matt Red to win it, 70 to 59. That is win number 28 in county for Maryville, which is looking to make a second straight appearance in the final four. And they've got a get by Chillicothe tonight. And Maryville head coach Mike Kowitski uh, joins me now. And coach, we're back at it. Uh, the winning streak continues, and here you are, uh, one game to the state tournament. What, what kind of pressure are you boys under tonight? Well, I don't think they're under a lot of pressure, John. I think they're focused and they're ready to come out to play, and I think they're going to have fun tonight. I think it's going to be a good ball game. Well, you got back-to-back -back games, and last night I saw that game, and that was one of the most uh, fast-paced, intense games I've seen in a long time. Or you think you guys are tired at all? I, I think that fatigue might be a factor. I, you know, it was an up and down the floor most of the night. Savannah was running her break, so legs might be a little bit tired, but we're going to try to get some people off our bench early, try to get some rest from, and get our bench in there. All right, you're 2-0 against Chillicothe this year. They start some freshmen. Uh, you played them twice. This is nothing new. What do you do tonight? I think those freshmen are no longer really freshmen. They're more like sophomores now. They're playing really good. They got a quality team. I think we got to do the same things. I think we got to try to make it hard for Bland to get the ball. I think we got to put some pressure on them, and I think we got to execute against their defense. I think you guys played pretty well offensively last night. Not too bad. I thought it started coming around better in the second half. We started clicking late in the game, and I felt good about the way the game ended. All right, you guys go out at 7.30. Good luck. Thanks for coming out. Thank you, John. All right, Mike Kowiski, head coach of Maryville, with me uh, as that team gets ready to go for win number 29. No losses for that team this year. Hey, there's one St. Joseph team still playing, the Bidden Girls in the Class 4A district. They go for that title tonight. It's at uh, Central High School. Park Hill is 20 and 6. They beat Central, the Indians, by 25 in the semifinals. The Cards beat Liberty 45 to 43 to advance to tonight's finals. That their press break, we possibly could break their press break and not worry much about that. But the offensive end, their man-to-man -man defense is good and they're big inside. So we've been practicing a lot against man-to-man. -man. Uh, defensively, we plan to make them only get one offensive shot. If they get only one shot and we get the rebounds, then that will be to our advantage definitely. I think they're beatable. I think that we, if we just play together and play hard, then I think we can beat them. All right, that is Benton taking on a Park Hill tonight and the girls. And uh, right now, the uh, Chillicothe girls have a 22-11 lead in the second quarter over Carney in the 3A district final. We'll have uh, all these highlights and the scores uh, coming in tonight at 10 o'clock. Scott and Deb. John, are there a lot of people there tonight for this district play? Uh, this place is only, what, the, the game uh, just, just underway. Not a, about an hour till the guys' game. This place is already packed. Uh, the Maryville fans are, they really packed this place. They've got that side full and half of this side full. So uh, there's going to be a lot of noise here tonight. You can already hear it now. You're right, John. We'll see you again at 10. Thanks right. very much for that report. Well, stay with us. There's more straight ahead. It's our biggest car and truck clearance of the year. The end of winter vehicle clearance at all big five new car dealer locations in St. Joseph. New and used cars, trucks, and vans now being liquidated to make room for the spring allocation. But only through Monday. Nearly a 1,000 vehicles now marked with the lowest prices ever. Plus, you could win an incredible St. Joseph shopping spree and the great $1,000 St. Joe giveaway. Through Monday, save thousands of dollars on the vehicle of your choice. Nothing held back. Look for the big yellow clearance sale banners at each of the big five new car dealer locations in St. Joseph. Finally from us this evening, our weekly Pickies Profile. That's right. Looking back through American history, entrepreneurism has been a way of life for many, whether it's creating a brand new product or producing a better variation on a theme, seeing the need and then trying to satisfy it is the spark that drives many onto new things. Such is the case for St. Joseph resident Mark Young. When he isn't working at his regular job, Young, along with his wife Zara, run a local engraving business out of their garage. Young says he started precision engraving because he didn't see many other engravers in the St. Job market. Plus, he wanted to do something different. What do you like about doing it? What's, what's the attraction? Oh, just being able to make something out of just a plain piece of glass or block of wood. 
Young has also been able to snag a couple of corporate accounts during his short time in business, engraving wine glasses for Holiday Inn's 10th anniversary and mugs for Quaker Oats gift shop. An example of one of Young's biggest projects graces the training room doors here at the St. Joe Frontier Casino offices. Young says that this was a very unique project due to the size of the pattern as well as the detailing that was involved. It turned out very nice. We got a lot of very good feedback on it. Most people came in and saw it and they really liked it. Young adds it's the creative aspect that he likes best about the engraving business. I like the... Uh just let just bringing me the gun stock or a piece of glass and saying put something in this to, for a wedding gift or um, uh, something to promote their business. Young and his wife are hoping to put their two children through college with the money brought in from engraving. Now, if you own a local business that manufactures a product or know of one and would like to see it profiled here on News Team 2, send the information to Picky's Profile in care of News Team 2, P.O. Box 6247, St. Joseph, Missouri, 64506. Good for him. Great story. Mm -hmm. Well, coming up tonight at 10 on News Team 2, Bob Waters will have more on the Missouri Department of Natural Resources charge that there are pesticides in many residents' drinking water. Also, everything from standards on drinking water to rules on meat inspection would be affected by a House bill passed today. We'll have details on the Republican-backed bill. That and more tonight at 10. Good night. Good night, everybody. VHS copy of any News Team 2 program, call News Team 2 Review at 364-2222. So